In the short amount of time that has passed since Crew-1 made its historic voyage, and that's what you're watching right now, is some interviews with the crewmen and the ship itself, the Crew Dragon has become a fixture of the American space program and of NASA itself. However, relatively few launches have been carried out. In spite of this, an all-civilian launch at the time of this recording is going to be launching in just a few hours. Now, reason would dictate that the first all-civilian mission of Crew Dragon follow the same procedures and the same trajectories of previous missions, with the exception of not docking with the ISS. The same orbit, the same capsule, the same technology, essentially making this as routine as possible, especially since you have people who only have a few months of training on board. And yet, this is not what is happening. At the insistence of Jared Isaacman, who's the guy that's paying for all of this and the commander of the mission, the inspiration for flight is going to be pushing Crew Dragon to unusual boundaries, a different orbit and a higher orbit than mankind has gone to in over half a century. Plus, there have been new technological modifications that have been made to Crew Dragon that have yet to be tested in space. All of this is very interesting. It's exciting to push boundaries and very interesting that it is for civilians who will be pushing this boundary. Now, given the technology involved and the company involved, I have every confidence that this mission will be a resounding success. But what's very important is the fact that this mission must be a success because this mission is the most important SpaceX flight to date. Why is this the case? My name is Jordan Wright. I was born in the same year that the human race took its first steps on the surface of another world. And then we promptly betrayed those people's legacy by never going back. But now, over half a century later, there's a new breed of pioneers that are seeking to finish what these people set out to do so long ago. But there is trouble as well. So it's time for commentators like me to stop being polite and start getting angry! There is, as most of you know, an intense backlash against this whole billionaires in space concept. The argument runs the way it's always run. Why spend billions of dollars going to space when we have all these problems here on Earth? the only planet that we know of that can be inhabited by human beings. This is the precious place that we need to preserve. This is where we need to be spending our money, not to send billionaires into space. And I'm here to tell you, these people are full of sh Three of the four people on Inspiration4 are not billionaires, nor are they Jared's friends or anything along those lines. They are people who were selected either at random or through other processes through St. Jude and others. So these are people who are deserving, certainly, and exceptional individuals in many ways, but in many other ways, they're extremely ordinary, certainly not astronaut material. Material. Well, one of them arguably is, but the rest of them certainly are not. And that's the whole idea behind this. Not to take them to the ISS, obviously, but to take them to orbit. Ordinary people who have not gone through the extensive NASA vetting process will have a chance to experience things that most astronauts experience. Not going to the ISS, of course, but they will be experiencing the G-forces of takeoff, more importantly, the G-forces of re-entry in that experience, 
and they are also going to an orbit that no other human spacecraft has gone to since the 1960s. And this is the point, the entire message of the Inspiration4 mission, that not just astronauts get to push the boundaries of space, that ordinary people can do things too, and also do things that very few real astronauts get to do. And this is something that is truly exciting and in many ways frightening for the people involved. Two of the three people who are on this ship had to think extensively and talk with their families before they made the decision to go, and only one of these three people can really be defined as an extreme space enthusiast. So let's meet some of this crew. This is an interview from Space.com. Go ahead and stop by there if you want to actually see the interview. But the fellow on the left is obviously Jared Isaacman. I wouldn't actually define him as a space enthusiast, but more of an extreme experiences enthusiast. He's been many places across the planet, many dangerous places with very harsh environments, pushing his body to the limit, and this is just another Another experience for him, I believe. An extreme experience, an experience he certainly believes in, and he also flies high performance jets like the MiG 29, so all of that makes sense. But I believe that he's going to move on to other experiences once this is done that have nothing to do with space. Whereas, on the other hand, Dr. Cyan Proctor is a space enthusiast through and through. Ever since she was four years old, she's been dreaming about going to space. She applied to be an astronaut, got to the final stage of NASA's vetting process, and was turned down. And so has been dreaming about this opportunity ever since, and was shocked and delighted to hear that she would be going. She's also a certified pilot and has lots of other skills which will prove useful on this mission. She's a very sensible candidate. And the next candidate is sensible as well, but for entirely different reasons. Haley Arsenault is not on this mission because she's a space enthusiast or anything else. She's simply an extremely deserving people, person rather, from St. Jude. She's a survivor of bone cancer, and once she did survive, she dedicated her entire life to St. Jude and helping children with cancer. She is an ideal candidate as far as charity work is concerned. However, she knew absolutely nothing about space. At first, when she was told about this mission, she thought that she might be going to the moon, having no idea that the human race had not been to the moon for 50 years and was not likely to be going back for some time. It is astounding to me that a college-educated person would not know these facts, but that is the reality for the vast majority of the population. They simply don't remember what they were taught about space history and don't really keep up with it. And that's why this young woman is such an important member of the crew. She's a person for the general public to connect with. She is a giving person. She is a tough person. She's gone through all the training exercises every bit as well as the rest of the crew and has adapted very swiftly, even though she has a prosthetic implant in one of her legs as a result of her cancer surgeries. Millennials and Generation Z kids will like her because she's one of them. Very young, the youngest person to ever go to space, extremely dedicated and devoted to her goal and her mission in life and her profession, so adults are going to like her too. And she comes from a very good and supportive family. This is just a heartwarming story about a girl who never even thought about going to space, but now is completely pumped to do it. And this is the most important aspect of the Inspiration4 mission. Let's take people who don't know anything about space, have no interest in space, and their friends who also have no interest in space. Her friends at first thought that she was going to be on the next episode of The Bachelor. I mean, that's just how out of touch with space her friends and associates were. And now they've researched the Falcon 9, have researched SpaceX, and are as enthusiastic about what 
she's doing as she is. So the whole goal of Inspiration4 is to take people like Haley and turn them into space advocates. And this is a remarkable objective and what makes this mission so important. But it's not the only thing. The one candidate who truly represents the rest of us is Chris Sembrowski, and I hope I'm pronouncing that name right, but in any event, Chris is a guy who is so much like the rest of us. He entered the contest to go on Inspiration4 mostly as a whim. Yes, he went to space camp, and yes, he did have some interest in NASA, but he didn't tell his wife that he had entered into the contest. When they started calling him, his wife thought that it was a telemarketer calling, and even when Inspiration got him on a Zoom call or a conference call of some kind, at first he thought that they were trying to sell him something. I mean, his enthusiasm for space is definitely there, but he's not exactly a massive space advocate. He is a generous giver to charity, there's no question about that, but we wouldn't call him an exceptional one in a million charitable supporter or anything along those lines. He's just an ordinary guy. And even though he was a bit intimidated by certain parts of the intense training program, he has risen to the occasion and pulled his own weight. Again, sending a message to the rest of us that just about anybody, no matter how ordinary, can dream of doing this, can train to do it, and head to orbit legitimately and safely. Is this guy a billionaire? Hell no. Is he friends with billionaires? Hell no. As a matter of fact, neither were a lot of the other people on Verging the Galactic or even on the New Shepard flight with Wally Funk. So that's what makes this mission so important, is to demonstrate that this is not just a billionaire's only club. Yes, currently you need a billionaire sponsor, but that doesn't mean you need to be buddy-buddy with him, spend years trying to influence him and lobby him to go to space. He may just simply select you. As a matter of fact, right now, Richard Branson has a contest offering this opportunity to just about anybody. And of course, this, I think, will inspire other billionaires to do the same. This is a huge opportunity to make the human species interplanetary, to introduce the wonders of spaceflight to the ordinary run-of-the-mill person and to make them excited about space. SpaceX and commercial space has a tremendous amount to gain from this. However, they also have a lot to lose. At Jared Isaacman's request, or kind of insistence actually, the orbit of this Crew Dragon is going to go higher than any Crew Dragon before it. Indeed, any manned capsule whatsoever since the early parts of the space program. It is the ninth highest orbit achieved by any manned spacecraft. By way of comparison, the International Space Station flies at a height of about 408 kilometers, whereas this will achieve a perigee or an apogee rather of 575 kilometers. Is this problematic? Well, the Crew Dragon was designed to re-enter from this kind of altitude. However, the higher your orbit, the faster your re-entry speed, simply because you're accelerating from your higher orbit all the way to the point to where you start hitting the atmosphere, which means it's going to put a greater strain on the heat shield. An unacceptable strain? No. Has it been tested at this kind of heat and this kind of pressure? Yes. However, has this ever been done with a Crew Dragon spacecraft, or indeed any spacecraft for many, many years? No, it has not. It's a bit of a unique risk. And the heat of re-entry is nothing to be trifled with. This, these are satellite components that are being exposed to a plasma simulator that essentially simulates the heat of re-entry. Look how quickly this thing is falling apart. Without a heat shield, you're pretty much done for. Of course, Crew Dragon has a fantastic heat shield, but it's not a heat shield that's ever been tested at this particular velocity. Yes, it's been tested in a lab, but not in practice. Do I regard this as a huge risk? No, not at all. I think it's an acceptable risk, but it's a risk nonetheless. 
Now, to be perfectly clear, I am not really concerned about this mission at all. I think it has an incredibly high chance for success, but it is the re-entry that bothers me the most. I'm not worried about the launch. The Falcon 9 has a tremendously solid launch record, and plus it has a great abort system in case there's a problem. However, during the re-entry, it's going to be a different velocity, a different trajectory, everything's going to be different than what SpaceX has dealt with in the past. How is all of this going to play out? Well, we can simulate it and we can make predictions, but we can't say with 100% certainty that everything's going to go well. I would say more like 99.9. .9. Now, another unique detail of this particular mission is the famous glass dome. This observation area that is, interestingly enough, put just over the space toilet that they have, and it's going to provide them with an unparalleled view of Earth and space around them. It's an amazing feature. Has it ever been tried before on a previous Crew Dragon? No. Has it been tested extensively? Well, of course, in laboratories, but it's interesting to me that this feature, which is important to the structural integrity of Crew Dragon, is being tried out for the first time on a civilian mission. Then again, this mission is all about pushing boundaries, and I'm confident that it is safe, but I just do find it interesting that it's being used for the first time, untried technology, on a civilian mission. And this leads me to the last detail of what makes this mission so important for SpaceX. If it succeeds, it will be the first of hopefully many civilian missions to orbit, many contests, many opportunities for ordinary people to go to space as we begin to become a spacefaring civilization. If it fails, it will be utterly disastrous for the future of SpaceX and civilian flight. To lose these three people, especially Haley, who is something of a saintly character, would be a tremendous blow to SpaceX and really to the world. So this commercial you're watching right now, this was designed to inspire people's imagination and excitement. But if something goes wrong with this mission, it will inspire only fear. But these are minor concerns, and I am confident in a few days the Earth will be welcoming the first all-civilian crew to go to space back to their homes, and it will be a huge media frenzy of a positive nature rather than a negative nature. Falcon 9 is a solid system. Their escape system is also solid and reliable, as you can see right here. Crew Dragon is a tried and true system that hasn't had any serious problems. So in spite of the modifications and the unusual orbit, I feel very confident that this is the safest mission that SpaceX could possibly plan given the circumstances. And I think it's going to be an unforgettable moment for the future of human spaceflight. If you like what I have to say, if you like the content of my channel, you know how to support me. It's all in the description. And I would also be very grateful for a like and a subscribe. So until these events start becoming commonplace, until ordinary human beings are going to space on a weekly or perhaps even daily basis, until the dreams of so many of us here on Earth become the reality of low Earth orbit and beyond, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.